Thank you, music team. Sarah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It's good to see you. Yeah, we say, come Holy Spirit. How do, you, how do you spend your time? How do you fill your days? It seems like we have, in many ways, simply been marking time over the course of this last year with this pandemic business, uh, kind of stuck following sort of limited processes and procedures. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Dude, I appreciate that. So, so this will stay uh, up here, so let it be known. Uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, thanks, Jerry. So it seems like we've been marking time. We've been kind of just stuck in these uh, limited, strict routines that we've been uh, following, repeating, especially, you know, uh, because of this pandemic, and, and it's been disorienting, uh, especially with what limitations there are, what we're allowed to do. And so it's been feeling uh, somewhat restricted, but now life is becoming different. Life seems to be changing, and we are, uh, the restrictions are being loosened, and it feels like things are changing. And it's summertime, and Calgary likes to go away in summer, even if it's smoky, like it is right now. But even with this, we are easily distracted. And so I wonder how we spend our time. What is the Lord leading us into? He is inviting us into being intentional, to being intentional with our time to be, uh, acknowledge the time we have, to redeem the time that we have. I mean, all of the time, not just those stolen moments in the wee hours of the morning when we say a, a quick prayer or before we drift off to bed and we say a quick prayer, but I mean during the day, during the course of your daily life to redeem the time. But what is He inviting us to fill our time with? And so that's what we're going to explore in the next uh, few weeks in this uh, mini-series entitled, Redeem the Time. God had made a, a promise. He chose a specific man, Abram, and made a promise and a commitment to Abram and his family that he would bless Abram and his family and that he would bless them and through them that he would extend and expand his family so that there would be people that would fill the earth. His family would fill the earth. They were originally known as Hebrews. Eventually, they became known as Israel. They were given the name Israel, the people of God, this family. But they had a rocky relationship with God. It was an on and off relationship with Him. It sounds a lot like a child and parent or child and guardian relationship in many ways. It was on and off. There were times when they would be in a right relationship with Him and then times when they would struggle and, and they would not. They would trust Him and follow Him and then other times they would be disobedient and rebel. And yet the Lord was inviting them all the while. And we know from our last sermon series, Longing and lament that a pivotal moment came in the people of God, the family of God, when they were taken into exile. So they were living in this uh, region, and half of them were living in the north, and half of them were living in the south, and the Babylonians came, and they conquered the northern region in 722 B.C. They came and conquered them and took all the people away and into exile. And then Sometime later, in 586, they went and they conquered the southern kingdom. And that's in that Longing and, Lebray series, Longing and Lament series that we were exploring that. And in 586, they came and they, they took those people into exile. And so they were now, the people of God were living with this difficulty, this, this uh, despair that they had, and complete disorientation. 
And that was the pattern of their uh, life. They're living in and out of this uh, pattern of relationship with God. They would have this orientation where they were in right relationship with God, but then through uh, sin and rebellion and the circumstances of life, they would go from this orientation into this disoriented life, this disorientation. But then they would move from that disorientation back to a new, or they would get reoriented with God, and that was the pattern. And we read through uh, uh, the Psalms and we read through other books of the Old Testament and we discover this pattern. But this pattern of uh, disorientation and reorientation and that reorientation was thanks uh, in large part because of the Lord's work. We could also call it in a way, it's a pattern of crucifixion and resurrection, a pattern of death and life. And the life brought about by the Lord Himself, Yahweh. But that pattern is not limited only to the Hebrews, the Israelites, the people, as my, one of my daughters says, the people of history. It's the pattern of humankind throughout history into the present time as well. We are living in that same pattern, and right now we could actually probably testify that we have been living in a, a state of disorientation. Difficulty, challenge, despair. Uh, of course, a, a large reason for it is this pandemic, this, this uh, disease, this virus has caused a lot of that, obviously. This, this sense of, uh, of, of disorientation. But we are moving out of that pandemic that we've been experiencing over the course of the last uh, 12 to 18 months, Lord willing, moving out of that, we're moving from that and we're moving to something else. But that reality that we're moving from is also reality that we're moving to. And that to environment, that to condition is also fraught with complexity. It isn't like we're just moving from a pandemic into a utopian state. It's we're moving to a complex, and that too is also disorienting. Masks and no masks, two-meter gap, no two-meter gap, get the vax, don't get the vax, and now we're all together. And it's still somewhat disorienting. Do we go back to work? Do we work from home? Do the kids go back to school? Is there in-person, not in-person? Do they have to wear a mask? Do they not have to wear a mask? Do we have to have a passport to travel? It's complicated. That's the two that we're moving into. And it's disorienting. But we also know that as we were reading in the Psalms, the Psalms are chock full of these testimonies of orientation, disorientation, and so on. And we need to admit that even as a church, we're feeling somewhat disoriented. Coming back in person, not in person, pastoral changes, ministry changes. It's complicated. And not only that, but many of you also have circumstances of life beyond the pandemic that are disorienting. A family member who's not following the Lord. A friend, a co-worker who's addicted. A classmate that you really like to hang out with, but they're struggling. And it's these seasons of difficulty that we're going through, even outside of the pandemic. And I hope that we've learned through this Longing and Lament series previously that the Lord is inviting us to be honest and to be authentic. Like we were singing. Now is the time. Come, come. To be honest and authentic when we are coming before the Lord. And that's what the Psalms were teaching us. To lament and to describe this disorientation, but also what we read in the Psalms is this glorious reorientation, the Lord's introduction of a new way, His desire to give us a new orientation, a new, different way to live, even in the midst of complexity, and to redeem the time. 
And that's what we're going to explore. If you turn in your Bibles to the psalm, Psalm 126. I'm going to read the first verse of Psalm 126. It's the introduction to the psalm. It begins, oh, the title is A Harvest of Joy. When you read the Psalms, read the titles too. There's some description there that's very helpful. A Harvest of Joy, A Song of Ascent. I could go into the reasons for what that all means, but I got to get into it here. So the first verse is When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. We were like those who dream. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, that phrase, fortunes of Zion, is, is a, a turn of phrase. It's a, a figure of speech. It's figurative language. And what it means is, when the, Lord, the, the figure of speech means when the Lord returns something to its original state, but returns it to its original good state. A figure of speech. He returned, when the Lord returned Israel to its original good state, when He released us, from our captivity, when He restored and He made us whole again and He brought us back into right relationship with Him and He took us out of that exile and where we were in captivity away from everything else that we knew and when He restored us. And actually, that's exactly what happened. They had been there, the northern kingdom for a couple hundred years, the southern kingdom, but then Persia under King Sirius came and conquered Babylonia that was holding, the country that was holding the people of God captive. Persia came and they conquered them under King Sirius in 539 BC. And one year after that, King Sirius gave permission for God's people, the Judeans, he gave permission for them to return to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild their temple. And What they're saying in this first verse is when that happened, when the king said, you have permission to go back into Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the temple, they said it was like we were in a dream. We were were gobsmacked, as the youth would say. Astounded. We were amazed. In shock and amazement. How did they respond after they were in this state of amazement and shock. How did they respond to God's surprise on them? When God surprised them in a good way, what did they do? Well, it's about time, God. It's about time you did that. We were waiting. What did they do? Verse 2 and 3. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. So how did they respond when they were released, and they were restored, and they were given permission, and they went back? How did they respond? With laughter. They responded with laughter. They responded with shouts of joy. When God surprised them in a good way, What they did in a word is they cheered. The people of God cheered. And I mean, that's what happened when the people crossed the Red Sea, when they were chased by the Egyptian army, and they managed to get to the other side of the Red Sea. When they got to the other side, they didn't have a sort of a quiet prayer meeting. What did they do? They got out their tambourines in their dancing shoes. And here as well, they shouted for joy. They cheered. They rejoiced because of what the Lord had done. And this isn't just shouting and cheering because of a natural sort of way of getting out of something. They got out of trouble, and so it was just a natural course. They acknowledged and they recognized that God had transformed something, that God had done something, that The king of another country had given them permission, and they said, that's God doing that. That's not 
typical. I call things weird. I call them holy weirdness. But that's kind of what's going on here. It was like holy weirdness. It's weird. That's weird. And they said, that's God. God has done this, and we want to shout and cheer because he has done this. And in the process, he was beginning to reorient them. He was beginning to give them a reorientation about what he is like. Because, friends, laughter and shouts of joy and cheering is an honest, appropriate, outward expression of God-given joy. Man, it's quiet. I don't know. I don't know. I'm getting nervous. I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about laughter. I'm talking about shouting for joy. I think you agree. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. See, it's, it's, it's still early, so they can still send me packing. So I want to spill it out now and rough it up now a little bit and see, you know. But I'm not making it up. Right? They cheered because they recognized that God was doing an amazing work. You know? I'm nervous about preaching about joy and laughter and cheering. It's strange that I would be doing that because we're so stoic and reserved and contained. What in the world? All right. But you notice what else they did? They said, that's what happened when we were released from captive. And they, that's in the moment, they rejoiced and they celebrated and they shouted for joy. But notice what is happening here. When they wrote this Psalm 126, it's after the fact. What they also were doing was recounting. They were retelling the story. They were retelling the story of what God had done. They were recounting. They were acknowledging that it was God who was doing this work. They were acknowledging that it was Him, and it was uh, beautiful and wonderful, and it was transformative. They were recounting the acts and the character of God. They were retelling that. Not only that, but they were recounting how they were responding when God did it. They recounted how they responded. Remember when God did that thing where He released us from captive? Yeah, do you remember that? Yeah, do you remember what we did? Yeah, we partied, didn't we? Yeah, we sure did. Do you remember that part too? Yes, I remember that. And they recounted and they retold. And you know what else they did? You know what was interesting? Is they also recounted the impact it had when they started cheering God. When they started cheering God, you know what they remembered and they recalled? They remembered and they recalled that the people in the communities around them, that actually they said all the nations around them, they took note they took note that the people of God, the people that had been in exile and were now free, and they were acknowledging God, and they were dancing in the street and shouting for joy, and the people in the communities around them and the nations all around them, they looked at those people, and they said, that is a, that, they're worshiping their God. That is the God. That is Yahweh. That is the Creator. Who is that God? What's going on? We're at verse 3. What happens next? Because they had that joy, and then they retold that story and they recounted that. Look at what happens in verse 4. Here's what they say next. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping Bearing the seed for sowing shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. You know what they did after they had that celebration? They remembered that. They recounted all that story. And now in the present, what the people of God did in the present is they started praying and pleading and requesting the Lord. What they started doing is they recounted that and then they said, Lord, do it again. Do it again. Do that a thing again, Lord. Free us again, Lord. Restore us again, Lord. Do more of that, Lord. Caleb, 
saying to the Israelites, give us another mountain, Lord. Give us another challenge, Lord. Do it again, Lord. And they prayed and they pleaded before the Lord, do it again. And now their lives were reoriented. Their lives had been given a new orientation. They were reoriented. They were seeing and acknowledging the God who is Lord, the God who does deliver. They were acknowledging God's true character, what He is really like. They were acknowledging what God does, His actions. They were acknowledging that they would come to Him, that they needed to give up their control and their agendas and their way of doing things and come to the Lord and seek His ways and seek Him and talk to Him and pray to Him. Their lives were being reoriented. A reorientation, a new orientation where Jesus, the Lord Yahweh, in their time, Yahweh was now Lord and Savior. An important distinction that Tyler made last Sunday. They were going to Yahweh because He is Lord. And He is Savior. He's the one we follow. He is the one we follow. He is the one. And He will also deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. Lord and Savior. Israel expected. Israel expected when they prayed and when they pleaded, they expected that the Lord would do it again. They expected that there would be more joy and more shouts and more cheering in their future. They expected that. They were praying for that. They understood that. And part of their confidence came from their experience because they recalled and they, 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 they understood that. So their, part of their confidence was because of their experience, which necessarily means if we're going to benefit from our experience and have confidence based on our experience, then we need to retell those God story moments. That's how we benefit from our experience. When we recall and we retell that, and we retell it again. But it's also a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus himself. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus himself. We learned through the New Testament account that before Jesus entered Jerusalem, he cried over Jerusalem. He was weeping over Jerusalem because he could see the, the turmoil and the despair that was there. And then he went into Jerusalem during the Passover week and within days he was betrayed and within days he was crucified. But then, on the third day, he was raised to new life according to Scripture. For the joy that was set before him, as the writer Hebrew says. So this understanding that they had, the Israelites had, was also a foreshadowing of Jesus on earth. But it's also a foreshadowing, that is a foreshadowing of the joy that is yet to come when Jesus Christ returns finally and he restores everything. He restores the fortunes of all his creation to its original design and intent. And there will be no more COVID or anything like it. No more racism. No more viruses, no more division, no more hatred, no more violence. Hallelujah. And there will be shouting, and you can join if you'd like. Right? Yeah. That's what's going on. Foreshadowing the delivery. You know... I, I wonder uh, how we respond. I, I mean, I, how do we respond when God surprises us in a good way? What is it like? What, what, it, what happens when God surprises you in a good way? Uh, now, the, the question kind of implies a few things. It implies... 
that God has surprised you in a good way? Has God surprised you? Has God done something in your life that is good? The question also implies that you are aware and can acknowledge that God has done something in your life. But then also the question is, well, what's a surprise? Is it just the really big things, like when he takes a group of people out of exile and, and, and moves them into freedom? Or is it large and small things? What constitutes a surprise? Friends, the culture that we're in, that we've been baked and stewed in over the last number of decades, is against surprises. It's against amazement. It's against wonder. It's against newness. The dominant culture. If you think I'm not telling the truth, listen, there are franchises like Holid Holiday Inn and McDonald's that have built their franchise on the point, no surprises. That you can go into uh, one place here and another place, the same franchise in another country, and you'll get the same thing. No surprises. Because the dominant culture is actually trying to domesticate the people of God. They're trying to get you calm and comatose and unaware and not alive and awake and shouting and cheering the work of the Holy Spirit and Yahweh and Lord, who is God. And so they're just kind of putting a silence on it. There will be a big and awesome day when Christ returns. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it won't, no one will have to guess and wonder when that's going to happen because it'll just be like really significant and awesome and magnificent. But there is also the present. And he is doing this throughout history. He is desiring and aiming to reorient people and to give them a reason to shout and to cheer. So, has the Lord done that in your life? Has He drawn you to Him? That's good. Has He done that? Has He worked in a relationship of yours with a, a friend or a co-worker? Has He ever given you self-control? Have you ever expressed kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, peace, patience? Those are all works of the Holy Spirit. I've just been listing the fruit of the Spirit. Are these things that he's been doing in your life? A short time ago, last week, the week before, Kimberly and I were out visiting our daughters. And it was great. We'd visit with them. And then Kimberly and I would go back to our hotel room. And in the middle of the night, I'd be up for a couple of hours and I'd be praying uh, for my daughters. I mean, wrestling with God. You know, like, I mean, wrestling with God, like, just really, because I love them, and I care for them, and I'm deeply concerned for them, and then the next morning, go and pick up daughter number one, and we start having this just fantastic conversation. Go pick up daughter number two, and we just start having this fantastic conversation. We start talking, and that's all I was really, I just want that, you know? Later on, I said to Kimberly, it's like, wow, yes, thank you, God. You know? Thank you, God. Yay. Yay. It wasn't crossing the Red Sea. It wasn't taking, uh, you know, a whole people group. It was that moment. And, and, and to get, and you know what? I even laughed. Yeah, I laughed because in the night I was wrestling with the Lord and at times I'm like, Lord, how's this going to work? And, and I'm concerned and I can't figure everything out and here's my babies and they're not babies anymore, they're adults. You know what I'm saying? And, I'm, and, I'm, and then we have this conversation and at, at one point I'm saying, yay God, but I'm also laughing going, man God, you know, that, that's just, that's funny. You know, that I'd be wrestling like that 
and, and I, I'm coming to you, but I guess I'm, I'm trusting you somewhat, and I have some faith, but I guess I don't have a lot of faith, and I'm not trusting you fully, and then you do this thing, and it's kind of like, I'm just like, yeah, you know, that's awesome, and it's funny. What was particularly interesting to me is that part where at the end of these verses it says, first they say, you know, uh, we, we hope, we pray that those who, who sow will reap. And then he finishes by saying, yeah, that's actually what's going to happen. That those who sow will reap. And that's, that's a, it's, it's an agrarian metaphor. It's a, metaf- a farming metaphor. Jesus uses that uh, metaphor in the New Testament as well. He teaches a parable about it. And what's particularly interesting to me about it is he, he describes, Jesus describes the seeds as being the gospel message. The essential message that is that Jesus is Lord. That's the seed in this farming metaphor. And when people talk about Jesus, when they talk about the gospel, when they proclaim that Jesus is Lord, good will happen. Reaping, reaping will happen. Reaping means something good will happen. The good that will happen is that when people talk about and live out their life as Jesus is Lord, the good that will happen is that other people will begin to look into it, begin to ask questions, and ultimately begin to allow the Lord to reorient their lives so that they start following Jesus as Lord and Savior too. That's the reaping. And what he says here and what Jesus follows up in the New Testament is that that's a guarantee. That's actually going to happen. You see? And you know, you know how I know that that's true? You know how I know that that is true and is a fact? Because I'm a follower of Jesus. Because he saved me. Because he called me. He redeemed me. Has he redeemed you? Has he called you by name? Are you his? Because then that, you can also testify that that prophecy back in 538 that they started celebrating and on throughout the centuries is actually a fact and is true. Are you with me? So then what he's saying is, friends, this is good news that we, we recount and we retell the actions, the character of God and what he's doing, and we shout and we celebrate that, and then we continue to pray, and we continue to pray for our friends and our family members and our co-workers, because the commitment is that as we continue to sow those who continue to sow will also reap. That's encouragement to you. And if you need to wrestle with the Lord and persist with Him. And that's encouraging Westview because that's what we're on about. As we coming out of this and as we continue, the church was never closed. We were dispersed for a while. And I, I hope that we're, as we come together, we still disperse into the week. But it's encouraging to know that as we continue to talk and live out Jesus is Lord, that other people will get their lives reoriented as well. That they will come out of the addictions that they're in. That they will come out of the broken relationships that they're in. That they will allow the Lord Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit to restore their fortune into a life that is reoriented. And that's worth celebrating. You know, this last number of weeks, um, there was the Olympics in Tokyo. And I I love the Olympics. Um, I love watching it. What's interesting to me is how we actually enjoy cheering. And we enjoy celebrating. We enjoy having a good time. We even enjoy kind of laughing and cheering at the same time. I also follow baseball. Yeah. And I love it when, when, when somebody, like, okay, and I like, I like running, so I'm cheering, and, and I mean, I don't even know these people personally, but something, there's something going on. And then in baseball, okay, team comes up, guy at the, at the plate, and he just, ba-boom, and he hits that thing out of the park, right? And what I love about it, we cheer, and it's so fantastic, but then you hear the commenta- 
commentator at the same time, the ball goes way out there and it's in the second bleachers and the commentator says, forget about it. And along with the cheering is there's some laughter, this joy, this sense of, of, of wonder. And that's what we're talking about. The people of God have this freedom and this purpose to cheer and shout and laugh when God is doing things in our life on a daily basis. And don't just save it for the Olympics or for the baseball or the hockey. I mean, if you're doing that, fantastic. But maybe that should be an indicator that, hey, what is the Lord doing in my life? What has He done today? What is He seeking to do in my life? That's the question. You know, I wonder if we don't cheer when the Lord is, has done something remarkable, does it even happen? If, if, like, it still happens, but you know what? We miss out. And when the Lord is doing something in your life and He heals a relationship or He binds something or He helps you with self-control or with kindness or goodness and He does that, but you know, it's like a home run out of the park and the crowd is just cricket, skippy, quiet. Right? You just, you, just, you just blew it. There was a home run and you didn't even get a chance to, you didn't enjoy it. You didn't redeem the time. You didn't redeem the moment. I want to invite the music team to come up. We're going to conclude. The Lord is inviting us to redeem the time. To, to be aware of those moments in the day when the Lord is doing something fantastic in big and in small ways. Often it's even it's in the midst of difficulty. In spite of the difficulty to redeem those moments in the day, to go ahead and laugh, to go ahead and cheer, to go ahead and say, yay, God, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you. He's inviting us to redeem the time and also to recount and to retell those stories. This is a way we pass things on from one generation to the next, from a friend to a friend, to recount those moments when the Lord did something miraculous, when you noticed Him doing something and you retell and you retell that story. Because friends, I want to tell you something to be aware of, that bad is stronger than good. Bad is like the bully on the playground of your mind. There's a lot of bad. The news is full of bad. And bad is a bully. And it's trying to get your attention and it's trying to fill your head. And it's the bully on the playground of your mind. So we need to resist the devil, as James writes. We need to resist the devil. A young uh, uh, boys' uh, brigade leader of mine said, if you need to, you just, you just say directly, get lost. Leave me alone. One of my daughters says that's what she does as well. She, she just says, get lo- leave me alone. But with, along with resisting the devil, James also says, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. And the way we draw near is by recounting the stories of what he has done in our lives. That's how we draw near. To be aware. And redeem the time. So the Holy Spirit is just like everywhere. He's just like everywhere. We're not bringing him somewhere. He's there. He's in your home. He's where you're working. He's in the school where you're going. He's there. He's with you. He cares deeply about you. Redeem the time.